Welcome to the Tech Money Podcast, where the worlds of technology and personal finance collide. Hosted by certified financial planner, speaker, blogger, and self-proclaimed personal finance nerd, Malcolm Etheridge. Each episode aims to make you just a little bit smarter about your money, all from the perspective of the tech professional. Without further delay, here's your host. Hey there, listeners. Malcolm here. And on today's show, we're talking about equity compensation. More specifically, we're talking about the various solutions out there to provide employees of private companies with the liquidity they need in order to exercise and take ownership of their shares before an IPO. If you've ever worked for a startup, then you know it can feel like watching paint dry, waiting for the company to reach its light at the end of the tunnel, going public and allowing you to finally cash in on all of your hard work and contribution and building nothing into something. In many cases, it can take more than 10 years. And since the average tour of duty for a mid-level software engineer at a tech company is just north of two years, I think it's fair to say not many are sticking around long enough to see the paint finish drying. But what of their stock options? One of the main drivers of tech workers deciding to go work for untested and unproven startups rather than working for one of the more established incumbents with all of their fringe benefits is for the potential financial rewards of getting in early and helping to build something from the ground up. Thankfully, there are now quite a few alternatives to staying at the company forever solely out of fear of losing your equity package, or maybe even worse, forfeiting those options altogether. That said, I am by no means an expert on the complexities of stock option financing, so I decided to call up someone who is and have a conversation. Vijay Piawazdi is the Senior Director of Equity Strategy at SecFi, a platform designed to provide employees of startups with financing to gain access to their shares prior to an IPO. Vijay and his team are responsible for providing those startup employees with the educational resources and planning tools to help them make informed decisions on how best to manage their equity. Vijay is a certified public accountant, and prior to joining SecFi, he earned both his bachelor's and master's degrees in tax and accounting, and worked as a tax consultant with one of the other big four accounting firms. So with that brief introduction, welcome VJ to the Tech Money Podcast. Thank you, Malcolm. Excited to be here. Excited to talk, talk stock options. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I appreciate you coming on and doing this. And in my intro, I breezed through your resume pretty quickly. What else should I have included there? <laughs> Oh man, you know, I think uh, I always like to talk about the things I like to do for fun. I'm mm-hmm. an avid golfer, um, picked okay. up during the pandemic. Terrible golfer. Um, you know, <laughs> I think I use <laughs> I use my golf game to, to catch up with some old friends um, in my busy life today. Uh, but, you know, one thing I'd probably highlight on my resume is that I am a deep tax nerd. Um, I had my master's in tax, like you mentioned on that intro. Um, I worked at PwC for five years um, mm-hmm. and I still work in tax in some shape or form here with stock options, because as we're going to find out, taxes are a huge piece of stock options. For sure. Uh, But I still keep up with everything. So I am one of those weird guys who really enjoys tax law. So I'm glad you said that. That was actually really interesting to me because we just did an episode uh, a couple of shows ago about the tax implications of managing your equity and the fact that like every single decision you make, whether you don't do anything at all, or you actually sell some sh- some shares at some point or whatever, always has a tax implication to it. So it's interesting that you say that because you, you still ended up in it, even though you're not necessarily preparing tax returns or giving tax advice or anything like that. Like you just couldn't stay away. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I if you look at my resume or LinkedIn, you know, I did two years of tax returns and, and compliance work for hedge funds. But what I really love to do is helping people manage their uh, their taxes. How how do you minimize your taxes within the rules? How do you plan ahead for your taxes? So naturally, that um, that brought me here to SecFi, where I'll help uh, startup employees and executives really plan around it. And as you mentioned, you hit the nail on the head, right? Stock options, everything in regards to stock options has to do with taxes. Yeah. And unfortunately for most, most people just do not understand taxes in general, or nor stock options. So uh, that's why SecFi is here, and that's why you know we're here speaking today. Well, I also uh, I said that, but I didn't include the fact that not everybody who is a an accountant or not everyone who is a financial planner or not everyone who's somewhere wedged in between 
even cares to deal with equity compensation because of its nuance and its complexity and everything else. And so even though you can find somebody who's a tax nerd, doesn't necessarily mean that they want to to operate in this space and take on the the complexities of it. So that's that's also an additional layer on top of how hard it is just to even find folks that um, can give you good tax advice. But I, I mentioned in my intro that you're the senior director of equity strategy at SecFi, right? Specifically your title. Can you tell us a bit about your role and what that entails? Yeah, so I joined SecFi just about four years ago at this point. I was employee number seven, the first uh, non-technical hire. So it's been a wild journey. We're over 100 employees now. Uh, It's been fascinating to see. So uh, really my primary role, and I say primary because as anyone who's worked at a startup, you wear many hats, (laughs) have Mm -hmm. to do a little bit of everything from accounting to legal to, (laughs) I mean, your day job. Uh, My day job here at SecFi is I primarily work with startup employees and executives and help them create plans around their uh, their equity compensation to hopefully maximize the value of that equity. So we navigate the complexity, the complexities of taxes, complexities of stock options, help them come up with a plan and figure out the best way for them to exercise, potentially get ahead of taxes or generate some liquidity prior to an IPO for various reasons. So let's then talk about the company a little bit more, right? Not necessarily what you guys do, because we'll get into that, but how it all came together. I think as employee number seven, you're probably uniquely qualified to tell me about the the origin story. Um, Startup employees not being able to sell their shares until the company, you know, comes public is a very nuanced and high class problem. So why did it why did you guys ever come to be as a company? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right, Malcolm. It's a little bit of a champagne problem, right? Your company <laughs> grew too big. And, you know, it's kind of this silly thought process that you did exactly what you're supposed to do and grow your company. But when you do that, you come up on this problem. And that's exactly what happened uh, to our founders, right? So uh, the origin story is SecFi. The company was based off personal, created based off personal experience. Uh, our founders were early employees at a startup that grew like crazy. Um, they I were see. A very early. Um, I think they were sub 20 employees when they both joined. They went to university together um, and the company grew in over two in under two years. Um, the company had over 200 employees, was grown like a weed um, and they went to exercise their options. Right. They saved up the cash they needed to, to pay the strike price of their options, like a lot of people do. Uh, mm-hmm. What they didn't know was there's something called a tax bill when you exercise your <laughs> options. So this is a very common story, which I'm sure we'll get into later in the podcast, but um, they didn't plan for equity. They didn't seek help. Um, They just thought that they would have to write a small check to the company to exercise their options and they become owners of those options. Unfortunately for them, uh, they were hit with about a $1.8 million tax bill when they tried to exercise. So it became a very terrible situation. Um, And on top of that, they both had left the company, um, you know, two plus years at a startup and they were looking to start their own thing, wanted to take Mm -hmm. a little bit of a break uh, and then hit with a 90 day exercise window. So you're in this situation, our founders were in a situation where they needed to come up with $1.8 million in 90 days. And when they did that, all they could find was people looking to effectively take advantage, looking to buy their shares at a severe discount. They couldn't mm-hmm. find help. They went to San Francisco, New York, uh, talked to funds, talked to brokers, and they couldn't find anyone to help them. Long story short, they ended up losing their options because of this when one of those brokers pulled out at the last minute. Wow. So terrible situation for them, but became a driving force for starting SecFi. Um, you fast forward to today, uh, SecFi, we're a VC-backed platform. Uh, we're mm-hmm. the leading equity planning platform, uh, where in short, we help employees better manage their equity, help them make better plans, uh, uh, and to maximize the value of their equity. And on top of that, we also do provide a financing solution um, uh, for, sec- uh, for, for employees and executives of fast-grown startups. Yeah, according to your website, you guys have provided startup employees with over five hundred million dollars in financing to help them own their shares since launching back in 2017. And then I also read in TechCrunch. See, I do my research before these. (laughs) I read in TechCrunch (laughs) that you guys recently added another 
150 million dollars to your original uh credit facility so i have to imagine we're we're beyond proving the concept here right these the the, the two founders you're talking about it clearly were on to something and demand is clearly there for what you guys are doing yeah absolutely you know i think we found product market fit very quickly um our founders realized that they weren't the only ones with this problem they talked to a few friends at pre-ipo companies like uber and airbnb who had exactly the same problem um, and they quickly sought out a solution for them um, and that was about five years ago but the industry you know we've come a long way you know you talk yeah. to you, you talk to cfos five years ago who when we when we're pitching stock option financing as an alternative to a tender offer, people almost almost laugh us out the room, thinking this is this doesn't work. There's a bunch of issues with this. You know, you fast forward to today in 2022, we have CFOs, CLOs reaching out to us to set up programs hmm. for their employees so they can take advantage of it. So, been a big big change over the last four to five years, um, and it's been fascinating to watch. So, talk me through the concept a bit more. Right, I'm an employee of. Airbnb back in, let's say, 2018, right? The IPO is imminent at that point. We just don't know when. My wife and I find out we're having a, a baby and I go into panic mode. I'm creating a real story here because this this recently uh, was my life to some extent. So we need to buy a house before the baby comes. I own shares of Airbnb with a strike price of, let's say, $25. We expect the company is going to go out somewhere north of $50. So it's sort of a no brainer, right? I come to you and say, VJ, I have these shares. They're probably worth a couple million dollars today, but I know, I know well enough and you know well enough that they'll be worth three or four times that in a year or two. This is 2018 again, but I need half a million dollars to buy a house today. What do I do? You say what to me? Yeah, so I guess first off, Malcolm, I think it's it's really important to talk through the two different use cases for a financing. Yep, right? Please, I think you 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 might have blended the two into one, and just for the listeners, just want to break them up a little bit. So. Um, it depends on the situation. Let's say an individual comes to us with unexercised stock options. So a lot of people don't know this, but stock options does not mean you own the shares. It means it yep. gives you the right to buy one share of the company. Now, exercising stock options typically comes with a tax bill. Um, and by exercising earlier, you potentially can save a lot of money on taxes when you eventually sell the shares. I'll call this the tax arbitrage or the tax savings, right? The majority of clients come to us because they hear that, hey, I want to exercise today, become an owner, and I want to get ahead of my tax bill. Yep. Uh, so that's use case number one. We're helping them take advantage of taxes, hopefully get them exercise and save a boatload of money on taxes, knock on wood. The second use case, uh, which is uh, what I believe you're alluding to, is a situation where an individual, let's say, already has exercised those shares mm -hmm. um, and they need a home. Um, they want to put a down payment on a home. They can't wait till the IPO. Uh, so in that situation, you know, we may be able to offer them $500,000 today. They don't have to sell their shares um, and they only pay us back after an IPO. So okay. those are two use cases, but they both function in the exact same way today. So Malcolm, using your example, right? Our financing, whether you need the $500,000 to exercise your options and pay your taxes or put a down payment on a home or buy a Tesla or pay for a wedding, whatever the situation is, yeah. we'll give you that $500,000 today, non-recourse. So what do I mean by non-recourse? Non-recourse means uh, your personal assets are not on the line. This is mm -hmm. not like a bank loan where you're gonna have to pay back that 500,000 regardless. Um, we give you that $500,000 today and you only pay us back if there's a successful exit. So very critical to our financing product and why it's so employee friendly is that let's say worst case scenario happens. And I know this is very unlikely for a company like Airbnb, uh, but let's say we give you $500,000 today mm -hmm. and the company goes public and the shares are already worth, call it 200,000. Yep. In a normal recourse loan, you're paying back that $500,000 regardless. When you work with us, the only thing you have to pay us back is that $200,000. So we completely hmm. assume the downside risk associated. That's a big, big difference in our financing versus traditional, you know, call it recourse loans. <laughs> I'm, 
Uh, so I'm glad you made the distinction between the two scenarios that I was creating because you, you're right. I, I, I was coming at it from the perspective you laid out similar to the founder story initially. I saved up really diligently, bought those shares myself because that is a story, a conversation that I, I come across with would-be clients quite a bit. Um, and then decided I needed additional cash and now I'm strapped because all of my savings went toward buying into into my position. Absolutely. Basically. Um, so a bunch of things there in what you just said. So I want to make sure I try and capture all of it uh, accordingly and don't don't miss any of those little nuggets. So forgive me or, or bring me back on course if uh, I start to stray. But using my similar example, I want to make sure that I understand uh, where you're bringing us out to on IPO day. So yeah. I started this thing in 2018. Now it's 2000 Airbnb is set to IPO in December. And so now I'm looking like a genius for not selling back in 2018 because the price was set at $65, $66 or something. And actually, I think it peaked at close to like $150 when they finally came out. But I had a lockup. Right. I didn't get to liquidate right. on IPO uh, a day or some other nuanced thing like that inside of my plan. Folks like BuzzFeed employees found out later about, right? But I still have right. this note due against my shares. What happens between us in that scenario? How are you guys made whole? Anything different yes. in that way? So first and foremost, you only pay us back when you're able to sell your share. So inclusive okay. of any lockup period, we give you the $500,000 in call it 2018 when you need to buy the home. You buy the home, you don't pay us back a penny until Airbnb shares are liquid on the public market. Now, hopefully everything goes well. It had a great IPO when the lockup period comes undone. We'd ask you to pay us back that $500,000 plus a set of fees associated. That's when we okay. get paid. And that's how we we like to align ourselves and call it, try to make it as win-win as possible, right? If we only get paid back, if there's a successful exit, uh, we're on the same side of the aisle as the employee or executive. We're hoping Airbnb continues to grow and has an amazing exit alongside mm -hmm. the employee. So unlike purchasing or selling shares where there's kind of a winner and loser, if you think about it, right? Um, our situation is we both share in the upside together. So you may or may not realize this, but it, it depends solely on whether you're already a fan of the show and have been listening or if uh, you're just now getting getting turned on to it. But in a recent episode that I mentioned where we were discussing the the tax implications of managing your equity, I sort of teased out this episode because I made mention of the fact that one of the biggest challenges I see for employees of startups is that the equity they own is often their single biggest asset, right? It's more valuable than Absolutely. their home. If they own one, even multiples of what they have saved in their 401k. And I just mentioned that like savings has been wiped out if you manage to save up enough to buy into your uh, position. So, you know, and I work for peanuts compared to my friends at Google or Amazon or whatever, because <laughs> the single biggest asset is the stock, right? It's that future Absolutely. promise. It's that promise of a future uh, larger lump sum. But that Absolutely. future promise is also extremely illiquid, which is what you've been talking about, which means that while I'm waiting on this company to finally make it to the big liquidity event, I might have been having to put my own financial goals on hold uh, under normal circumstances, kind of in the scenario I just laid out where I need to buy a house because my family is expanding, but I'm also in this, this uh bind. Uh, I might find myself making some bad financial moves out of desperation in instances like that. Like you mentioned, there are some predatory uh, practices or uh, in in earlier days, at least there were uh, they were a lot more common. It, would you say that that's generally the profile of who you guys are here to serve or am I completely misreading this thing? No, Malcolm, that's 110 percent correct. Right. You know, we typically work with uh, you know, fast growing startup employees and executives that are in exactly that same position. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the years is that most employees don't start planning for their equity until mm -hmm. they come across a situation where they need to buy a home or the company yep. filed an S1 and are about to go public. Well, quite often, right, that's a little bit too late. Ideally, in a perfect scenario, and I can I imagine you can relate to this with your clients, is that you get to them much, much earlier. You get to mm -hmm. them when the company's valuation is still low. You can help them plan for the equity and give them options down the road. You have the ability to you know, 
for example, take out that $500,000 to buy a house. Now, things are a lot different when you're six months away from an IPO and instead of $500,000 to exercise your options, it may cost you a million or two million, for example. And that's money you're leaving potentially on the table by not planning ahead for it. So yeah, Malcolm, you hit the nail on the head, right? I think it's you know typically fast-growing startup employees with illiquid assets um, that do not understand taxes or stock options. Um, and for that reason, they put it on the back burner and they don't plan around it until they're forced to. And unfortunately, that's too late. And what we're, that's what we're trying to change here at SecFi. We're trying to help yeah. people make a plan and get ahead of that. I think you use the right phrase when you said in a perfect world, because as you're alluding right. to, people only ever call me when their hair is on fire. And you know, at <laughs> exactly. that point, like we're having to, to, to rush to make decisions if we can do anything even at all, um, which actually is how I came across you guys uh, in the first place. Right. I was looking for a solution on yeah. behalf of uh, a client and, and came across you guys and was like, huh, now this is interesting. Um, but so to that end, like what is the average financing term look like for you guys, right? I ask because I know from third hand experience that the earlier an employee is to the party, the lower their strike price likely is and the longer they have to wait to exercise. And thus it, it costs a lot more to exercise the, sh the shares themselves, the fees and my God, the taxes, as you just pointed to. So what types of customers are, are your average customers, I guess, is a better way to say it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's good to separate uh, things out, right? We, we have an equity planning suite where we help employees from all walks of life, a seed stage company all the way to the pre-IPO companies. And that's purely on the planning perspective. We love to help out as many people as we can. It's part of our mission here at SecFi uh, to make sure our employees don't, <laughs> don't end up in the same faith as our founders. Um, what you're, I think you're alluding to, Malcolm, is our financing solution. Now, mm -hmm. what I always tell people, our financing solutions typically look, uh, targeting individuals at a fast growing company that is going to be liquid in the next call of three to four years. That's typically our sweet spot. We work with companies um, that will be going public next year and we'll also work with companies that may be a little longer. But I'd say the vast majority of clients come to us because our company's growing and they're targeting an IPO in the next call of three to four years. Um, now, I think one important thing that you mentioned, right, you know, um, about exercising uh, earlier is that, hey, by working with us on the earlier level, the reality is if your company continues to grow, it's only going to get more expensive as your company grows, right? Mm -hmm. So we call it a stock option paradox, right? It may cost you only call it a hundred thousand dollars exercise today, but if your company five X's, 10 X's in valuation, um, call it in two or three years, it yep. may cost you a million dollars, for example, to exercise your options at that point. It's exponential. And I would much rather pay 100000 to exercise my options and accrue fees on that 100000 than pay a million dollars. So you are right in that there is, a, there is a time aspect to all this. You want to time it correctly. But generally speaking, if your companies continue to grow, it's only going to get exponentially more expensive. Uh, so we try to get them as early as possible, try to help people out. Um, you know, uh, it, the earlier, the better. Uh, but of course, every situation is going to be unique. Every company is going to be a little bit different. So uh, when you make plans for equity compensation, it's very uh, bespoke for each individual. But so it's also been my experience that the closer a company gets to IPO, the more desperate and irrational employees of that company tend to behave, right? As you were talking about, like they make the announcement and now it's this kind of like ready, fire, aim uh, kind of thing going on. They can almost taste the money at this point. So they start spending as if they have it. Uh, and so the thing that I'm curious about, and you touched on this a little bit uh, in one of your earlier comments, uh, is that there are people out there who will say, we'll just buy you out, right? You, you have $2 million worth of need here. We'll, we'll buy your shares. We'll step into your 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 place and we'll step into your place in line but at a steep discount i'll cash you out and then recoup my costs when the the ipo finally happens why even bother being a, a lender then in you guys case yeah absolutely so i think it's alignment with the employee mm -hmm. right when you think about a lot of employees right they have worked so hard over the last call it 
two, three, t- maybe in 10 years to go get their company to this point. Um, and Biden selling the shares, like, I'm not against it. I just want to throw that out there, right? Yeah. There warrants a time where employees, maybe it's the right move for whether it be diversification or they're just looking to take some money off the table uh, or they have a cash need. Completely understand. Uh, but the reality is, and I just touched upon this earlier, is that, you know, when you sell your shares, there's typically a winner and a loser, right? You yep. sell your shares and the share price goes up, that employee is going to have a little bit of FOMO and think, well, I could have had X amount if I just waited. Um, or they could have been on the other side and the IPO couldn't have gone so well, and maybe they're very happy that they sold their shares. Um, as we all know, it, you cannot predict the market perfectly, right? <laughs> we have no idea what's going to happen. Companies that filed S ones um, and you think it's going to happen, you know, quite often doesn't. We, we see what's happening with the market right now where, mm-hmm. you know, the IPO market is completely dried out. Um, so when you think about our financing, I like to think of us as an alternative to a secondary sale, uh, secondary sale, meaning you're buying or selling your shares. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, it's another option for you on the table. It's a way yeah. for you to either get cash today or for you to exercise your options and you could stay long on your shares, retain some of the upside and take the risk off the table, right? You get some cash today to exercise your options um, or put a down payment on a home, take some money off the table and you retain the vast majority of the upside of the shares. You're not selling off the shares and giving up the upside. Um, so it is just another tool um, in, in, in for, for an employee or an executive. And what we typically find is, you know, when, we work with employees or executives. Um, it's the ones who really believe in our company. You know, I've been yeah. here five, six years and I don't want to sell a penny of my shares, but I do know the smart move is to take a little bit of money off the table, take care of my family, X, Y, and Z reason. Um, and our financing allows them to diversify, get cash a day, as well as um, retain the upside. So a little bit of different scenario. You know, I think it's sometimes people do both. They will sell some shares and work mm-hmm. with us on the remaining of their shares. Yeah. I, I, so a couple of things in there, you, you, you got my antenna uh, up because one of the things that I find myself having to, to inform people sometimes, employees of tech companies, like you said, are usually pretty bullish on the, the company's prospects, especially while they're still working there. But the thing that I have to remind people is that just because you're bullish on your company's stock doesn't mean your spouse or your partner is. And so doing both taking some chips off the table does help your your spouse or partner sleep at night, even if uh, you yourself are, are are in it for the long run. But also, I think over the last couple of years, 2020 and 2021, it's easy to be really bullish. And so anytime I'd have a conversation with a would be client about taking some chips off the table, it was almost sacrilegious. Right. They were they were ready to to physically fight me. But. Absolutely. Now that the market has sort of normalized a little bit and it's not uh, so easy to just throw darts at a dartboard or, you know, a high tide is raising all boats kind of scenario. Now that we're in a normal market, people are a little bit more open to the dialogue about splitting, splitting uh, the approach right between uh, brake and gas pedal. So that makes sense. Um, but one Absolutely. of the things I've. I found unique uh, as you were explaining it, you, you guys approach is that you don't require your customers to make any interest payments or anything else until after the company has gone public and the liquidity event has happened. That's obviously an intentional choice. So why was that the design? Why not hedge your bets a little bit by requiring them to at least make interest payments while you guys are waiting? Yeah, absolutely. It's largely alignment with the employee, right? So Mm -hmm. from an employee perspective, we want to make sure that they can use this structure, even if they don't have a lot of assets. For example, you know, we can work with an employee who maybe very early on in their careers, maybe the first job out of you know school for them. Um, they may, you know, they're still working in tech, so their salaries are pretty good, but they may not be able to afford a one, $2,000, you know, monthly or quarterly interest payment. Yep. Um, so it's really making sure that the employee, um, you know, is aligned with us you know we want to win together as a team we're here we work with companies that we think are going to have great exits and ipos um, and we want to make sure that all employees can participate 
Now, we force it to, you know, call it a monthly pay down or an interest payment. That's going to kill off a subset of employees that we cannot work with. And that's something that we did not want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's really just the way we view our product, right? We want to make sure we're aligned with employees and try to help out as many people as possible, uh, whether they have assets today or not. Makes sense. The, uh, that statement is so striking to me because uh, as you and I were talking offline about the work with folks in tech who get paid in equity, who are younger folks and maybe haven't built up a ton of reserves just yet, that whole conversation about uh, making sure that, that uh, if they're not already rich, it's not a slap against you. It's not a knock against you and making sure that there are professionals out there to work with you and products and services Absolutely. out there to serve you, even if you are not one of the folks who you know are coveted by the the larger firms to say go get rich first and then come talk to us. Absolutely, you no. Know, it's kind of one of these things where I always say you need money to make to, to go get help with your money, and it's kind of yeah. this backward statement, right? And I think if you think about it in a funny way, startup employees are underserved for that exact reason you just mentioned, Malcolm. They are paper rich; they are not mm-hmm. yet rich, mm-hmm. and um, a lot of advisors, CPA, they may not want to work with you until you actually have money to pay them. So, in a weird way, tech employees are underserved, and yeah. we're hoping to fill that gap. Um, I know there's a lot of great advisors out there uh, like yourself who are working with tech employees um, and helping them out with their equity. And it's part of our mission here at SecFi to help as many people as possible. So we, we saw that gap and we're helping address it. Yeah, it is interesting to me that you guys employ financial counselors to chat with potential customers to help them understand the potential outcome of each decision they're considering. Um, And like you said, earlier on in their career, too, because, as I said, most of the time when people find themselves in these situations, they're pretty desperate or rushing to make a decision and often make pretty hasty decisions that they then come to regret not long after, simply due to a lack of knowledge and maybe even access to good information. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we see it all the time. People don't plan around their equity until they're forced to. (laughs) We're trying to change that. Obviously, you know, as a financial advisor, you probably understand that most people come to you when they have a problem, not before it. (laughs) So, you know, we're trying to change that conversation, trying to get ahead of it, trying to put out a lot of materials, of software tools out there so people can understand their equity and get to them before that moment. Um, and, and you are absolutely right, Malcolm. You know, when your back is against the wall, uh, you tend to do desperate things. That's when yeah. all the predators come out. That's when people are out there, you know, looking to buy your shares at a discount. And you're in a lot of people's eyes. It's, well, this is better than nothing. I might as well take it. Um, When in reality, they did a little bit of planning, got ahead of it, they'd be a much, much better financial situation. Um, And and all this is a little sad if you think about it, because employees work so hard for their equity. Um, I know firsthand as a startup employee how hard the startup thing is. Um, You work really hard. The hours very high. um, And you're quite often, in terms of cash compensation, not getting paid what you can command at called a FANG company or a big tech Mm -hmm. company that's already public. So, um, you know, lots of your compensation is tied to your equity and we want to make sure that employees realize that and plan around that and help them make better decisions around that so on that note though uh, i guess in the other direction do you have any success stories you'd care to share anyone you guys were able to step in and help that you're particularly proud of Oh, man, I have quite a few, if you don't mind me sharing here, Malcolm, but there's quite a few companies. You know, I think one of the earliest companies we work with, and I still, one of my favorite companies is DoorDash. Uh, We Mm -hmm. were brought in to do an equity education session at DoorDash. And the minute I walk into the door, and what's funny about this is this is right before the pandemic started. So I just remember being in a room of call it 50 to 60 early, early employees at DoorDash. And we're all kind of uncertain when this thing was going to shut down but we came in did a presentation and the feedback we got after the call was like wow we really yeah. needed that thank you so much we came in there explained how stock options work talked about how the, the solutions that are at your at your fingertips you can use financing use your own cash getting them ahead of that tax bill and as we know doordash had a wildly successful ipo mm-hmm. um, and we helped a lot of people save a lot of money um, i still am friends with some of our clients to today hmm. um 
and it was a wildly successful story where things worked out. Um, on the flip side, I did also want to highlight success stories of companies that didn't do as well. And I think the big component of our financing is that it's non-recourse. And as we know, not every IPO goes according to plan. Not every yeah. company grows to the top right like DoorDash, unfortunately. It's just the reality of it. Um, and we wish that wasn't the situation, but that, that's just what happens. And there's many situations where we did work with the company. We had high hopes for that company, but they didn't have a great IPO. And this has been popping up, especially over the last call, four months. You know, a lot of uh, IPO companies, their stock prices are down 40, 50, 60 plus percent from their IPO price. Um, and without naming you know, specific companies, we have worked with a lot of amazing employees at these companies, helped them exercise or got them some liquidity prior to IPO, take money off the table. Um, and unfortunately, the IPO didn't work out for them. But the reality is they didn't have to write a one hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar check to exercise hmm. their options. You know, we took that on the chin and that's part of our product. Obviously not a great outcome for us. We were hoping sure. the company had a great exit. But we've worked with so many employees who came to us afterwards that they said, hey, thank you so much. This worked out really nicely. Um, you guys saved me a lot of money by not using my own cash to do this. Yeah. Uh, so I did want to highlight the downside scenarios, right? Because it does happen. And, you know, it may not have seemed like stocks could go down in 2021. But as we mm -hmm. saw in this, in this first quarter, you know, there are downside scenarios. But overall, Malcolm, I think it's just been fascinating to help employees from some of these fast growing companies, right? We were working with Stripe employees back when they were still, you know, called sub ten billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's been fascinating to watch them grow and grow with them. So lots of success stories, whether a company has a great IPO or not. That's awesome. Well so my last question actually has absolutely nothing to do with anything else that we uh, have have covered so far, so you can take your your sec fi hat off and relax your shoulders just a little bit. But let's say you never discovered your passion for taxes and or equity compensation planning. Right. But money wasn't a factor in your decision making at all. What do you think you'd be doing right now? Oh, man. Great question. Um, I think I would be a school teacher um, hmm. and okay. coach for high school football. Kind of a weird, you know, like I, I've always ever since I took my first economics class in high school, I realized that there's a huge gap in knowledge and personal finance. I'll mm -hmm. teach some sort of class. I call it life or finances 101 in high school and then coach football. I love football. I think playing football in high school changed my career trajectory uh, and made me learn accountability. It made me learn hard work. Um, and obviously I was not good enough to play in college, but just those four years of playing in high school, I think really set the tone for my life and my career and gave me the work ethic I have today. Uh, so I'd love the opportunity to coach young men and women um, in both, you know, call it personal finance, because I think it's brutally important and we have a huge gap in education today in regards to personal finance, um, as well as helping them become better men and women on the football field as well. Um, I think there's something powerful about giving back. So it's something that's on top of my mind. Maybe one day when SecFi has an exit, I'll be able to finally fulfill that dream. So here's what's really scary about what you just said. I joked earlier about you being a fan of the show and whether or not you had already kind of like uh, listened to us and been been tuning in. But in episode one, Eric, my producer, turned the tables and sort of asked me questions the exact same way, ended with the exact same question because we knew that was going to be the one we would ask all of our guests going forward. And your answer is almost identical to the one that I gave. That is wow. very scary, actually. The idea that, uh, you know, you would want to teach personal finance, which is exactly what I said, like kids need personal finance at the high school level specifically, because I think younger kids, uh, I just don't connect with them the same way. But then also I would want to coach high school football because I remembered how impactful some of my coaches were on my life now as a man and not just a kid in high school trying to figure it out. So like, it's very scary as I was sitting here listening to you explain that. Wow. Just how similar, uh, I mean, almost exactly the same, not even similar, <laughs> your response was. That's, that's eerie. Um, 
I, I promise you, Malcolm, that was not a canned answer. You know, I think that was something that I've truly felt this way. And, you know, I, I'm a fan of the podcast, but cannot say I have, you know, gone all the way back to the first podcast. So that is awesome. I think it goes to show how big a personal finance geeks we are. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. That is fantastic. Well, I tell you what, on that eerie note, Eric with an A, why don't you go ahead and close us out, sir? Yeah, I'm not going to say that was creepy at all. Um, I, <laughs> VG, I don't know if you're younger than Malcolm or older. I'm not going to ask that question, but could be mini Malcolm in the future. I'm not sure if that's uh, appropriate or not, but I would love to see what you guys would do if you could team up and teach a course because I think you both would be unstoppable. So, VJ, thank you so much for being on the show. And, of course, Malcolm, thank you for having him on the show. And our last thank you is always for you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Tech Money Podcast with Malcolm Etheridge. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Malcolm comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. We humbly ask that you share this podcast and leave a review as this will help other people find the show. You can connect with Malcolm on social at Malcolm on Money. We'd love to hear from you and answer any questions you have, and you can do so by emailing them to podcast at techmoney.com. Thanks again for listening today. For everyone at Tech Money, our hope is that this show helped make you a little smarter about your money. This has been the Tech Money Podcast. For more information on today's topic, to review the show notes, or to catch up on past episodes, be sure to check out malcolmetheridge.com slash podcast. And if you have an idea for a show topic that you'd like us to cover, or you want to send us feedback, the web address again is malcolmetheridge.com. You can also find Malcolm across all social media platforms at Malcolm on Money. This episode was written and created by Malcolm Etheridge, with the production, the editing and sound controls powered by Proudmouth. This has been a Malcolm on Money original. Thank you for listening. The information shared in this recording and by its guests represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not represent the views or opinions of the host. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. This content is not, nor is it intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. It is always recommended that you seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your personal financial situation.